بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين My dear brothers and sisters, let us begin by entering into a state of remembrance of Allah in obedience to Allah's command to us when He has commanded us in Surah Al-Jum'ah يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إذا نودي للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فاسعوا إلى ذكر الله O you who have believed when the call is made for the salah for the prayer on the day of Friday hasten or strive to the remembrance of Allah we therefore empty our hearts and minds from all of the thoughts and emotions that flow through and course through our hearts and minds empty them, center ourselves and in this state of peace, of spiritual peace, of sakina, We feel our souls do a sajda before the, pre before the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this state, we bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without partner. And we complete this testimony by bearing witness that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his beloved servant and messenger. I urge you as I urge myself towards the remembrance of Allah and being mindful of Him. And I caution you as I caution myself against disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being forgetful of Him. Because forgetfulness of Allah is the primary sin which our ancestor and first human being Adam alayhi salam committed. And it is something which is intrinsic in human nature. We are now, brothers and sisters, several weeks into our COVID-19 pandemic. And something that I've observe, observed is that a lot of people are essentializing, if you allow me the use of such a word. By this, I mean, people are forced into prioritizing what is essential to them. They do this in their shopping, in their clothing, and what they are trying to prioritize of their lives. Some have taken to discarding things that they no longer need, especially if they live in city apartments where space is very much at a premium. We have noticed this phenomenon being written about in some of the newspaper articles that describe how people have been coping with the demands of social distancing. It occurred to me that this pandemic is exerting an essentializing influence globally, cutting across all areas of human activity, even, I propose, religion. We note that the Saudi government has suspended Hajj this year. Uh, they have also urged all Muslims to do the Tarawih prayers at home. Uh, all Muslim governments all over the world have urged Muslims not to congregate at mosques, even though they still do. And while Hajj is certainly one of the five pillars of our faith, uh, was started by the Prophet Abraham salam, it is not the primary pillar of our faith. And while Jum'ah prayers are an obligation, many have suspended it based on the assumption that it is predicated on the physical congregating of participants. How do we essentialize our religion? And is there any real sense or any real meaning even to this term? The answer I propose is yes, because essentializing religion is a process we actually must be always and internally engaged in. It involves understanding our faith. It involves prioritizing the important over the peripheral. Many Muslims, unfortunately, prioritize the peripheral over the fundamental. As a very common example, we give more importance to the way we dress than to our ethics. Whereas ethics is a more fundamental and a much higher priority in our faith and on how Allah will judge us. 
The primary pillar or ritual or rite of our faith is the Shahada. The bearing witness that there is no God but Allah. It is the single most important thing. And yet so many Muslims have not been taught to pay special attention to experientially bearing witness to God. Sheikh Wali Raslan in his Risala to Fit Tawheed ends his powerful essay with the advice Fanfasil Anka Tashhadhu detach from yourself and then you will witness him. Bearing witness to Allah, brothers and sisters, is the most powerful and most beautiful experience one can ever have. It recalibrates our whole being. Experiencing Allah essentializes our individual faith far more than anything else. Experiencing Allah is personally transformative. It transforms you. It awakens your soul and spirit and opens the door to being taught and inspired directly by Allah. This segues very well with the theme I wish to continue from our khutbah from last Friday, which is to develop a way of seeing things from Allah's perspective, starting with Allah's perspective on our human identity. The fact that Allah's perspective is indeed something real is because Allah mentions very often you know, such and such, عِنْدَ Allah, for example, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ the, the noblest of you with Allah or in Allah's, in Allah's perception or in Allah's eyes, so to speak, are those of you uh, who are most, uh, you know, uh, most pious, most devout. <clears throat> and Allah mentions in many verses of the Qur'an aspects which are fundamental to our human identity. So seeing yourself, seeing ourselves with Allah's eyes is in fact the perfect way to essentialize ourselves. To answer the question, what is the most essential part of me? To recap from last Friday, we referenced several Quranic verses that point out that from Allah's perspective, A, or first, we were created to be Allah's Khalifas, that is his ambassadors or representatives on earth. Secondly, part or an element of our creation is something uncreated. That uncreated component is specifically Allah's breath that he breathed into us from his ruh, from his spirit. This is why we are semi-eternal beings, and this is why we will be judged. Third, Allah has offered us a trust, what is, he calls an amana, in Surah Al-Ahzab, which we as the human species collectively have assumed. These aspects of human identity are universal. They are more fundamental than our ethnic identity or our language identity or our family identity. They even go deeper than our biology. Biologically or physically, we are a mammal, warm-blooded mammal from the animal kingdom, basically a variation of the ape. But what differentiates us from every other being in creation are these three aspects that Allah mentions, that we are fashioned from a breath of his spirit, Therefore, we are his representatives and trustees on earth, carrying a divine trust. Once you truly internalize that your soul is a breath from Allah's spirit, you begin to understand the eternal message of the prophets and messengers, who are our finest exemplars on how to fulfill the divine trust that has been placed upon us and that which we have assumed and how best to fulfill it. Our Christian brethren have an expression for this. They call it imitatio dei, which means imitation of God or of being godlike. We are not prone to use this expression in Islam, although the closest we get to expressing this is in various hadiths of the Prophet. One is a hadith Qudsi, where Allah says that when He loves us, He becomes the eyes by which we see, the hearing by which we hear the heart by which we understand and we channel God via the actions of our hands and legs. And, other hadith, and another hadith where the Prophet urged us 
to adorn ourselves, to beautify ourselves with Allah's attributes. So for example, since Allah is all merciful, all compassionate, we too should aspire to be merciful and compassionate as, as much as we can. Uh, since Allah is all knowing, another example, let us try to be as informed and as knowledgeable as we can. Allah is almighty and beyond need. So let us try also, aspire to be strong and wealthy, etc. The underlying rationale for imitating God is actually disarmingly simple. It is because every attribute we have originally belongs to Allah. Allah is seeing before we are, were seeing. Allah is hearing before we were hearing. Allah is eternally alive before we were created. It is absurd, therefore, to suggest that Allah's capacity to see, to hear, or to understand is His imitating us. All of these attributes are originally His, <coughs> which He has, sent, has given an apportion to us in various degrees. But what may surprise many of you is that the Quran even describes our faith as God's very actions, from the general to the specific. I shall start with the specifics because the specifics are impossible to dispute and they are very clear cut. First, Allah says in Surah Al Imran, in the very be in the beginning of it, Shahid Allah annahu la ilaha illahu. Allah bears witness that there is no God but He, and so do the angels and those of knowledge <coughs> to establish justice. It is therefore absurd to suggest that Allah is here imitating us. The truth cannot be anything but the opposite, that Allah has commanded us to do what He Himself does. <coughs> Therefore, the very first being to bear witness to Allah is Allah himself. And the sequence flows from Allah to the angels and then to humans. So when you bear witness to Allah, it behooves us to remember that we are here imitating Allah. No one can suggest that our act of bearing witness to Allah can compare in perfection to Allah's act of bearing witness to himself but it behooves us to make our act of shahada as perfect and as complete as we can. <clears throat> and that we improve its quality. That is an act of essentializing our religion. And one of the ways of doing so is to remember that our soul is a piece of his breath and that it is through your own soul that you bear witness to Allah and manifest it in our actions and our ethics. Manifest the shahada in, your eth in our actions and our ethics. A second example is salah. Allah says also in the Quran, هُوَ الَّذِي يُصَلِّ عَلَيْكُمْ وَمَلَائِكَتُهُ لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ He, meaning Allah, is the one who does salah upon you in order to take you or to exit you or to remove you out of darkness into light. <clears throat> Our salah, therefore, is to complete the circuit of Allah and his angels' salah upon us. Again, it is absurd to suggest that Allah is here doing salah upon us as an act of imitating us. It only makes sense the other way around. That Allah established the the archetype of Salah, taught the angels, and then invited us to join him and the angels in doing so. This sequence is conveyed even more clearly in the another verse where Allah says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayuhalladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Indeed, or certainly, Allah and his angels do Salah upon the Prophet, all you who have believed, do salah upon the Prophet and greet him frequently or convey your peace to him frequently. The picture here is that Allah is inviting us to join him and the angels in conveying or expressing our salah upon the Prophet. 
From here, from these two examples, it is easy to see how the remaining pillars are also acts that pa God participates in with us. Fasting, for example, is, makes us imitate Allah and the angels who neither eat nor drink nor engage in any sexual activity. The imagery of the Hajj of visiting Allah's house invokes the imagery, the imagery of visiting Allah and communing with him. Zakah, which has two uh, components of meaning, one defined as charity, is certainly a divine act since Allah is the most charitable of all beings. The second component of zakah, defined as purification, is also a divine attribute since Allah is pure by definition. So we see how our five pillars are in fact human reflections or ways of imitating divine acts. Moving now from the specific to the general, the Prophet Hud says in the surah by his name in verse ayah 56, that indeed my Lord is on a straight path in Rabbi ala sirat al-mustaqim. If this was not true, Allah would not have quoted it in, in the Quran and would have taken issue with it. But the fact that it is part of the Quran is one more piece of evidence that our faith actions are Allah's actions. So the sirat al-mustaqim that we ask Allah to guide us upon in Surah Al-Fatiha is in fact something that Allah himself is on. The image here is that Allah is inviting us to, uh, figuratively speaking, join him on the journey on his straight path. Again, this highlights the idea we mentioned in our previous khutbahs of ma'ayatullah, of togetherness with Allah, of companionship with him. Another verse, a key verse in fact, is Surah Rum, Surah number 30, Ayah number 30 as well, in which Allah commands the Prophet and by extension all of us, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلْدِّينِ حَنِيفَةً فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ Direct yourself, literally direct your face, which means kind of focus your attention on religion sincerely to Allah's nature. Fitrat Allah means Allah's nature or the nature of Allah upon which he forged humankind or that he created humankind. That is real religion, Allah adds, but most people do not know. Real religion is part of Allah's nature according to this verse, a nature upon which he created humankind. But Allah laments, most people don't know this, or maybe even don't care to know this. Now, how can you read a verse like this and not stop in your tracks? When I first read this, it sure stopped me in my tracks simply because I did not want to be lumped with those whom Allah calls most people who don't know category. I want to be part of a people who do know category. So I sought to fathom this verse and it took me a long time to cross check it with other verses and to see the pattern that emerged in the way that I'm giving it to you now on a proverbial silver platter. Another piece of evidence is in Surah Al-Hashr, the last few verses where Allah mentions many of his, several of his names. When one of the names, that he, or two of the names rather he, he, he attributes to himself or describes himself by is Al-Mu'min Al-Muhaymin. Allah is Al-Mu'min. Allah is the archetype of the believer. The name Muhaymin is actually just an easier way of pronouncing al-mu'amin, meaning the one who makes someone become a mu'min. From this verse, we learn two things. Or the one that Allah is the archetype of the believer, and that he is the one who makes us mu'min, al-mu'amin, proving that we, what we said last week, that iman is an act of God. 
a grace and a favor, a minna in Arabic, that he bestows upon us and give gifts us with. Piecing all the above Quranic quotations together helps us see how our own faith and religious rites and actions are originally or archetypically Allah's actions, actions that he then invites us to emulate. That, brothers and sisters, is such an enormous act of kindness, such an enormous act of grace that we cannot really begin to fathom, nor can we adequately express our gratitude for. This whole analysis, brothers and sisters, is one example of seeing with Allah's eyes, seeing with his seeing, understanding with his understanding, or as I might say, a little bit of Allah's perspective. This is because there is no way to wrap our heads around the verses I've quoted above from a human perspective. How do you wrap your head around Allah calling himself by the divine name Al-Mu'min, for example, or Nabi Hud saying that, indeed, my Lord is on the straight path in the Rabbi ala siratim mustaqim. Translations fail to convey the sense, the simplicity, the, the directness of the Arabic Quranic terms because they try to understand these verses and expressions from a human perspective. The only way to gain a coherent understanding of these verses is by seeing with Allah seeing, by looking at all these verses from Allah's perspective. And the picture which comes forth is beautiful, it is breathtaking, and it is powerful. The only way, brothers and sisters, to perfectly understand the Quran is by understanding it through Allah's eyes. The only way to perfect our faith is by shifting our perspective from a human one to a divine one. From seeing ourselves with human eyes only to seeing ourselves with Allah's eyes. May Allah bless us all and may he enable us to see with his seeing, to understand with his understanding and to act in accordance with his preference for us. To that end, brothers and sisters, let us once again pledge to live our lives from the perspective of Judgment Day. Pledge to remember who you are, who you are, that you are breaths of God, and that because, and because of that, you are immortal. And because we are immortal, we will be called to account on Judgment Day. May we live our lives preparing ourselves for that day, and may it be a joyful and happy one for us, as Allah describes the, the doers of good, those who've received uh, his approval, who will be happy and cheerful on that day, whose lights will radiate from in front of them and around them. Brothers and sisters, pray to Allah that he may answer our supplications. Allah ta'ala an yastajib li wa lakum.